Welcome back to the Smoking Snake Podcast, the only English language podcast all about Brazilian football. I'm your host, Peter, joined as always by the other co-host, Enric, but we are not alone tonight. We are super excited to bring on another guest. Um, Our next guest is an expert on Brazilian football, and he is a commentator for Brasileirao Play on Paramount Plus and Fanatiz. Uh, you've probably heard his voice uh, if you listen to English language commentary uh, about the Brazilian League. Uh, a big warm welcome and a big thank you uh, to Mauricio Destri. Mauricio, how are you? Guys, uh, thank you so much for doing this and for having invited me. It's such an honor. I have thanked these two before and I want to do it again publicly. This is fantastic. Huge idea. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here. It's probably one of my favorite subjects, if not my favorite subject, to talk about football and speaking English also. Uh, you guys know that English is not my mother language, and I'm thrilled, uh, seriously, to be here. It's it's a fantastic idea, so thank you so much for doing this. What a night. Yeah, thank you. thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, Enric, why don't, you, uh, why don't you start us off here? Hello, everyone, and hello, Mauricio and Peter. We're really happy to have you here and talk about Brazilian football. I know you're a supporter of the team that we're going to go on and talk about in a second, and we're very excited to have you. Eric, thank you so much. Uh, We've been uh, speaking through Instagram this uh, last couple of weeks, and uh, it's, uh, again, I'll restate it. Uh, It's a fantastic idea that you, you guys had, and, you know, having invited me is, you know, uh, it's also great because I'm involved in the Brasileiro and have been for the past three years. So it's actually the third season that I've been uh, doing these comments that you guys uh, uh, literally hear. Sometimes we think that in some games we don't have much of an audience. And then, you know, maybe in a Flamengo game, in a Palmeiras game, Corinthians, Sao Paulo, that there's the uh, big things happen. So I'm uh, very glad that we do have some audience in the States and uh, hopefully in other parts of the world as well. Um, yeah, it's 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 been already, I can call it, I think, a, a long journey because it's, it's four, sometimes even five games per match week. And that's a lot. Like last week we had, um, we had 20 games in, in seven days. So, you know, wow. you can, you can picture that that is a lot. And, um, me and this other guy, Rodrigo Lazarinha, big shout out to him. Um, you probably heard his voice before in the Brasile Don't Play commentary. Yeah. I mean, um, we are hired by the Brasile Don't Play. So we actually work there every single week in four games, me, three, him, uh, five him uh, for me anyway it's it, it's been a huge journey but um it's been fantastic uh, i sometimes say that it's the it's the perfect job for me because uh, i do like to speak english by the way i i work as a english teacher at times i um i also do some translating work and i graduated as a journalist so you know it's perfect because i love football i love speaking english and uh, speaking english about football to me, it's just uh, it's just a pleasure. So I I barely even believe that these guys are paying us. Seriously, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's it's great. So uh, you know, it's it, it's awesome. Big shout out to all the guys. By the way, I think they're uh, at some point gonna gonna follow this podcast. Charles Mills, Anthony Wells, Laza, John Cottrell as well. Who else? Eduardo Bispo, uh, Bita Brazil, and so and so and so on. Ricardo Romani. So, uh, yeah, but as they don't play, shout out everybody. Yeah, I, I agree. It's 100% something that it's really exciting to have. And I'm not going to lie, there are matches when I don't even enjoy, like, let's say it's a Red Bull Bragantino playing against Bahia match. And as soon as I know that you're commenting, I turn on the channel and just want to hear what your opinion what? about the match or anything like that. Oh, man, so- come on, no. Seriously, you having have, you haven't inviting me to to the, to this podcast was already great. Now you saying this that sometimes you do watch watch matches because of us. What are you talking about? This this is great. 
it, it is so great that, you know, I, I can barely believe it because um, the prior to the first match that I commented, which was alongside John Cottrell, Fluminense, it was actually Fluminense São Paulo back in 2021, like two years ago, last month, I think. I had never commented a single football game in Portuguese or English. I, that was like my first match ever. I I, I kept on uh, crapping for like three hours or something because I had no idea what I was going to say. Uh, because I did speak English, obviously, but then speaking English about something that you're not really used to, it, it's probably like you guys speaking about, I don't know, physics or something. I don't know if you're into physics, but uh, about any well, gardening. I don't know, just picking up stuff from the top of my mind here. I, I don't know. And and obviously I like football, but it's it's different. It's absolutely different, and um, I think I've evolved. and uh, And thank you so much for your words, Enric. That was that is simply fantastic. A at times, I comment on games that I I have no idea how many people are watching. I think probably just the replays, probably just the highlights. I don't know. Live a uh, Goyas Bahia match, man. I don't know if we do have some audience there. I hope so. But anyway, you're saying that sometimes you do watch, so you know. I'm glad. Well, there's definitely a lot of games. And as you mentioned last week, having around 20 matches, like teams play every two or three days. So that's something really incredible. And I wanted to ask you, how did you grow up and how you became a fan of the sport overall in Brazil? Man, it's not hard. When you grow up in Brazil, and especially in Sao Paulo, obviously it's not an exclusivity of Sao Paulo and, and uh, Rio and all, all over Brazil that is quite common as well. But people who don't like football, like men who don't like football, I can say it's it, it's exceptional. You know, it's like the average, I don't know. Are, are you guys, for example, into American football? Or just football? You probably yeah. are, right? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Like, um... Like the average Brazilian man likes football. It's 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 a standard, you know. Um, I do have friends who don't follow football and they prefer like I don't know, like playing tennis or watching F one or even watching the NBA or some. I don't know, but it is not tough. It is not something that you have to like go after in Brazil. It comes to you like TV shows all over. The internet nowadays, I mean, it's impossible. You go to, you probably know all of these websites, but global.com and wall.com, Lancy and all of them. Um, it, it's it's basically automatical. Like in Google, it's uh, it's like the, the, the top of the search. There's already this, this portal. So, you know, it, it is something that we get brought up to and into. It's it's crazy here in Brazil. It's not tough, but um, but I did grow up in São Paulo and lived in São Paulo in my whole, for my whole life. And um, exception for two years when I was 13, 14, 15, uh, I spent some time in Birmingham, England. So um, I did do that. Um, it was between the years of two thousand and three and four. Uh, my mom got married to this Scottish guy. And he was working here in Brazil, and he got transferred to Birmingham. So uh, we packed our things and went, basically. And uh, I went alongside them. And it was complicated. I mean, England, great country. Love it. Except for the weather. I mean, it's pretty crappy. But um, uh, I, I was a teenager, man. I was like, I was 13. I was 14. I was 15 as well. So, like, it, it's probably, like, the worst age for you to, like, travel with your mom and your stepdad. It's like, you mean it alone? Not that I didn't make any friends. I did. But uh, but it's different, you know? Like, I, I was, I was like, you know, um, I, what did we use at a time? MSN, ICQ, uh, I don't know, MySpace. I was, like, um, uh, chatting with my friends back in Brazil, and they were all, like, starting going out. They were... Um, starting drinking, they were starting, uh, I don't know, really uh, meeting people. And then I was like stuck in England uh, all by myself, obviously with my new English friends, but it was diff different, definitely. So I made my way back just in time to watch Sao Paulo win the 2005 Club World Cup against Liverpool, my friends. I don't know. How <laughs> old are you guys, by the way? I think you're slightly younger than me. I'm 23. 23, Peter? Yeah, I'm, I'm 28. You're, you're 28, so a little bit closer. Do you guys remember that match? 05, Sao Paulo, Liverpool, Yokohama, Japan. I just missed it. I, I just got into the sport in 2006. So Wow. wow. Yeah, 
Enric, Enric, did do you remember that one? I wasn't a fan of Brasileiro back then, and I was only five or six years old. But uh, I've seen yeah. videos on YouTube. I, I think it's a big channel called Raptimo Videos, where they post highlights of really big matches, Brazil, Europe, all over the world. So I think Sao Paulo, Liverpool was a big one, surely, as you talk about it. By the way, it's right here. Oh, well, <laughs> I did it again. Sorry, guys. Um, look, it's right there. Uh, Rogério performing that save. And Stephen Jarrett's free kick. That was, I think, one of the best moments of my life. Seriously. <laughs> and it was just fantastic. I, I, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. But that save was, was, was special. It was, it's probably one of the most beautiful saves that I've ever seen. Probably not one of the hardest because it was from long, long range. But in terms of beauty of the play, it is simply perfect. Like the, the photos are so perfect. They're so symmetrical. The video that they have from from the goal behind it is just something so special, and uh, I'd already you know supported São Paulo. Obviously, we had to wake up at like six a.m. to watch that game, and uh, and we did it. We had fireworks, we had beer, we had something else at six a.m. Um, listening to Galvão Bueno, you probably know him as well. Of course, uh, but it was great. this is probably my best uh, footballing moment. Um. Up alongside others, but uh, th this was extra special. Just uh, just wrapping up about that phase I talked about, you know, living for a couple of years in England and then returning to Brazil. Um, so that was the the start of it. I began getting interested in football. Um, thought about maybe doing journalism, like uh, graduated in journalism. Went for it. I went to Puki Puki São Paulo, um, a Catholic university here. Quite close to where I'm currently living, by the way. I don't know if you're familiar with São Paulo, but I I currently live in Pinheiros, which is a mm. a, a west side um, neighborhood. Uh, Puki is in Pita Jesus, also pretty close, very close to Allianz Park, Palmeiras' ground. So um, it's uh, everything quite close here in the city of São Paulo, a city that I, that I love very much, guys. Yes, Peter. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of our pre previous guests, uh, Thomas Freitas, was telling us um, he grew up going. Isn't there a very famous and historic um, club in, in Pinheiros? Um, uh, I think they were. The Pinheiros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thomas Freitas, that name is familiar. I studied with the guy that goes by the same name. We might be speaking on the same person. I don't know. Is he a scout and a, uh, a an analyst that he worked for um, Juventus uh, of Muka? Right. I haven't. I don't know if I have his contact here on Instagram. By the way, you just uh, you just said scout. I do have a friend who's currently working as uh, as a coach in um, is it Detroit or Boston? I don't know. His name is Daniel. Um, okay. He he went to he went to Pookie with me. Um, Danielle Satchi, by the way, I'll, I'll mm. forward his contact because yeah, he, yeah. he would be great. You know, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a coach for like little kids, like under okay. 13 or something. I've seen his post is fantastic. I'm coaching all the boys. It's, it's great. Tomas Freitas, we might be talking about different people. Anyway, um, I could, I could look him up, but, um, Pulvi Pinheiros. I used to be I, I I used to be an associate. I used to go there. I I uh, I was brought up there. That's why I love tennis. There are twenty six tennis courts in there. I started uh, playing tennis in there. So uh, yeah, great place to. Well, you did mention Sao Paulo and them being your favorite club, uh, and the game against Liverpool back in two thousand five, two thousand six. Is that when you started uh, supporting the team uh, around that time? I know I, I was already a Sao Paulo supporter um, uh, way before that. By the way, the first ever game, my my, my parents, not my parents, because my mom doesn't care about football, but my whole family uh, supports Palmeiras. So they're a big Palmeiras. My name is Maurizio Destri. It's an Italian uh, last name. All the Italian uh, people here in Sao Paulo uh, tend to go towards Palmeiras. And, and my dad is a big Palmeiras guy. The first ever match that he took me to the stadium, it was an alien spark, as you guys can imagine. It used to be called Parque Antarctica. Antarctica, by the way, a beer company here in Brazil. Um, it was a Palmeiras 6, Ferroviária uh, 1 or 0. I don't know. I think it was 6-0. 
Um, and it still wasn't enough. It was in 1996. Palmeiras had like this great attack. It was uh, Luizão, Djalmin, Evair was in that team as well. 6-1, I guess. 6-0, I have to check. Uh, and still wasn't enough. Like, uh, São Paulo was doing an awesomely at that time as well. São Paulo were already twice uh, world champions against Barcelona, by the way, that Peter, you're um, you've shown uh, your na beautiful Neymar Barcelona jersey there. São Paulo beat Barcelona in, in 92, beat Milan in 93. Uh, and São Paulo already was, you know, a big deal here in, in Brazil, had a, a good team as well. So in like 1998, I started really going to the stadium with my dad. Thank God my dad, you know, left his uh, Palmeirense. I don't even know how to say that. Palmeirense, I think, be behind and then took me to Murumbi like many, many weekends. I remember seeing Hai coming back from Paris Saint-Germain, scoring two goals against the Corinthians, winning the, the Paulistão that year. So I do have those memories as well. So, uh, no, uh, Enric, in 2005, I was already a big São Paulo supporter. I was um, um, uh, in England, my uh, Birmingham days, I was uh, supporting São Paulo from afar. So uh, a little bit of suffering there in 03 and 04. But uh, São Paulo lost to a club called Once Caldas and got knocked out of the Libertadores back in 04. So that was big suffering. But then... Thank God uh, the year next to that, I returned to Brazil and saw Sao Paulo start the best phase ever. I don't know if any other club will be able to, to conquer uh, Paulista Libertadores and Club World Cup in the same year. And then the next year, Brasileirão, Brasileirão, Brasileirão again. That That is simply, but that, that is almost impossible. Flamengo were close, pretty close. Guys, I think Palmeiras might do it. I don't know. I, I don't see any other teams that are capable at this point because because they're solid man they're solid yeah and, and you guys know what i'm talking about right 100 yeah, percent. they were pretty much solid even in the campeonato paulista last season where sao paulo did not have a promising tournament they lost to agua santa and penalty kicks a team that comes from third or fourth division and maybe if they beat them they could have reached the final and played against palmeiras but what's your opinion about their tournament overall and what do you think went wrong with Rogério Senna? You said you're a big oh, fan man. of him, but do you see I anything am. with him? Yeah, uh, he's a complicated guy. He's a complicated char character. Um, he, he's my biggest idol in the world. I'm, I'm a big rock and roll guy, so I have some idols in rock. But I think Rogério Senna uh, might be the number one. Like, I love the guy, honestly. And as a coach, I do like him as well. But I have to agree that he's problematic. You know, he, he picks on players. He he has some dogmas. He really has to, you know, get loose to them. Because, come on, it's like Marcos Paulo, for example. Marcos Paulo is great. He's showing to be great in the last couple of weeks under Dorival Jr. Uh, Luan is also pretty good. Uh, not that Rogério used to have anything against them personally. But uh, Luan does have, by the way, we have to give him that. Lua does have some 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 weight problems, you know. He sometimes finds himself out of shape, so we do have to to, to give Rogério Ceni that. But obviously, in terms of relationship with the players, it's it's definitely not the easiest guy to to deal with. And he did have his problems at uh, at Flamengo. Although every time I don't know, São Paulo, Fortaleza, even Cruzeiro plays Flamengo. Everyone from Flamengo from that time, Everton Ribeiro, um, uh, Gabigol, Arrascaeta, they, they make sure they go all the way to Rogério, give him a, a strong hug, and uh, you know they, they're grateful for him as well. But it's definitely a complicated guy, you know. I think for São Paulo, the problem is much deeper. The problem, the problem goes goes all the way back to Juvenal Juvence. So I'm going to mention a couple of guys here. I don't know if, you, if you'll be familiarized with them, but um, they're from former Sao Paulo presidents. It mm. started with a Juvenal Juvencio, by the way, probably one of the best presidents of all time in his two first terms. But then he made this scam on the inside of the club to, to be reelected for the third time or for the second time to a third term. And that's really what, what messed up the... Really, the inside of the club, 
Uh, and afterwards uh, came Aleku, which is which is that other guy. He used to be a Sao Paulo counselor in the past. He had been working there for like 30 years already. So he had absolutely nothing new to present. Um, Aidar, Carlos Miguel Aidar, he was absolutely terrible for the club. He he actually th th there are actually scandals involving his name of um, actually, you know, deviating money from the club with, by the way, uh, there is a guy called Iago Maidana. He cl currently plays for America, America Mineiro. And, and this player was involved in that scandal. It was Iago Maidana. Um, he, he brought him, so he had some some uh, uh, um, uh, deals with the um, businessman behind Iago Maidana. So really, uh, Carlos Miguel Aidar did nothing good for Sao Paulo. And then currently, um, Julio Casares, I mean, I think the guy is doing his best, but we see he's such a, like a, a marketing person. Obviously, he comes from that background. He he does work at marketing. He used to be a, 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 a businessman for like Record, which is a big TV channel here in Brazil. Uh, nowadays, he is uh, Sao Paulo's president. But if he's doing a good job financially and people, some people actually even disagree on that, uh, it's not really doing a good job in terms of being a president. First, for you know the 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 the, the kinds of signings that he makes, uh, Giuliano Galopo, you probably know this guy. Yeah, it is still to be explained how so how in the world São Paulo were able to bring this guy. People said there were cryptocurrencies involved. Um, the Argentine club that he was raised um, was was asking for more money that was actually paid, and then. But it's still to be explained. So Paulo claimed there were were going to be investors behind it. I haven't heard of any to this day. So I don't know. It, it's complicated, guys. And then now the surgery. I mean, uh, Julian Gallup in the beginning of the year uh, hurt his knee and uh, made his way to Argentina to be operated. Um, and, and something very uh, strange went wrong with that surgery. Uh, he's now having to be reoperated here in Brazil, by the way, in the best hospital we have in, in, in Sao Paulo. And honestly, in Brazil, Albert Einstein Hospital, next door to Murumbi Stadium, by the way. Uh, he's having to be reoperated. That That is an absurd. And Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo didn't disclose that information. It's, it's like a background info that we're getting. So it is really tough. Only to, obviously, it's a very long uh, answer to your question, Herrick. But uh, but I honestly don't think it's only Rogério Senna's mistake, you know, or mistakes in the plural, because obviously there were some. But um, but we've seen him do well at São Paulo last year, for example. It was pretty good. São Paulo beat São Bernardo, Corinthians, even Palmeiras in the Campeonato Paulista. The Brasileirão wasn't so good. São Paulo made it all the way to the final of the Sul-Americana, all the way to the semi of the Brazil Cup, only to lose to uh, current champs, Flamengo, right? Playing pretty well at home. São Paulo did lose that game, but, but São Paulo played a decent match. So, I, I do like Jose Ducini not only as a player, not only as, in my opinion, the greatest keeper man at all times of all times, but um, I do I do respect him very much as a coach as well. Yeah, you're very right about that, and I respect him as a coach. I think he maybe he had the chance at Sao Paulo, but not what you could have expected from a, a coach that plays in the, in the team. But as a player, he was just incredible. Like you can just go and watch highlights of him scoring goals. I don't know if many people listening to this episode know about Rogero Senni and his goal scoring opportunities. I think he has more than 100 for Sao Paulo. And to stay in the club for such a long time is really fantastic. And he was actually giving a chance, I think, after he retired to play or to manage the team. Didn't go well. He moved on, went to Flamengo or I think it was Flamengo. And he won championships there and came back to Sao Paulo so he got a second chance but things didn't really go as expected and that's how we saw Durval Jr. come into place and I wanted to know about your opinion about Durval. Durval I think is a great coach he's been everywhere in Brazil he's managed Santos uh, Flamengo where he was most recently and do you think he can uh, rescue Sao Paulo for this uh, season in 2023? 
Actually, uh, I don't think it's in anybody's hands to actually rescue Sao Paulo. This is going to be a long-term kind of thing. It's going to take years. It's probably going to take decades because to build something uh, from ground zero, it's really tough. But to destroy it, you can do it in just a couple of months, a couple of years. And that's more or less what was done at Sao Paulo. So, uh, so, so it's not going to be any coaches that bring São Paulo back to winning uh, Brasileirão, winning uh, Libertadores. That's at least my opinion. So I, I honestly don't think it's in Dorival Jr.'s hands because I don't see São Paulo having the top one, two, three, even four vast squads of Brazil. Um, I used to consider São Paulo like probably two years ago. I don't know. I would see... I would see um, Flamengo, Palmeiras, Atlético Mineiro, and then maybe São Paulo. I'm talking 2021, maybe 2020. I don't know. But the fact is, nowadays, I mean, we can definitely put those three Atlético Mineiro, uh, Palmeiras, Flamengo, and then we definitely have to give credit for Fluminense. Fluminense are great. Uh, I also like Atlético Paranaense very much. I've, I've you probably heard this this before from from me. I I consider Atlético Paranaense now as a a big Brazilian club. Um, I I've said this uh, in a number of occasions that uh it, here in Brazil we do have, consider like twelve giants. So four clubs from Rio, from four from uh São Paulo, two from Porto Alegre, and two from Belo Horizonte. Uh, but then we we have to we are forced. To add this thirteenth one, guys, it's Atlético Paranaense. These guys have made have have made their way to two Libertadores finals. They, they are Copa do Brasil, Brasil uh, champs. They are Brasileirão champs as well. Th they do have one of the best teams in Brazil today. So many options. Like when you look at Atlético Paranaense's bench, you have you have Vitor Bueno, you have Pablo, you have uh, sometimes even Terence, right? You have Vitor Roque that blows you know uh hot and cold at times um still but it's really good uh who else you have cano you you have all of those guys so um Kuejo as well it's a great oh. team so you know i i i really think that sao paulo it's gonna in a cup in, in a brazil cup i mean sao paulo can reach the final eventually under dorival jr but dorival jr you, you also ask me about uh, personally about dorival jr so no, is he a great coach i don't think he is i don't think he is but he doesn't really need to be he's he, he is a rate seven and a half coach if so and that's enough and that's enough for for example at flamengo win both the brazil cup and the Libertadores. São Paulo maybe even win the Sul-Americana, maybe even take São Paulo all the way to the final, being a 7.5 grade coach. And that is good enough. So, uh, Dorival Jr. ain't no Fernand Diniz. I love him, by the way. Uh, ain't no Tichi. Also really good. Who else? We are really lacking in good coaches here. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> I I'm trying to I have names here, but I, I'm not going to mention, for example, Renato Gaúcho is one of the, the, the best coaches. Abel Ferreira definitely is, but it's um, not Brazilian anyway. But, um, you know, it's it, it, it's been pretty tough. It's been almost impossible to, names, to, to, to name uh, coaches for, for for this, for, for, for the Brazilian national team. I, I want a Brazilian to coach Brazil. That that is that, that is something that I have for myself. That um we should we should hire a Brazilian coach for Brazil. But I mean, if we can't find any, I'm not against bringing bringing um uh, what like a, a Guardiola, for example, Ancelotti. I, I'm not against these guys. They're the best coaches, by the way. They faced each other yesterday, there, right? mm -hmm. and uh, that was fantastic. You probably watched that as well. 4 nil was great and uh and unfortunately now I really want to see um uh, Ancelotti in um in in, in Brazil because I, I would be curious to see that uh but he I think I saw somewhere I think on Twitter that he said he oh I'll be here in the next season as well trying to trying to win the 15th for Real and then I said well shit I mean <laughs> what's, 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 what's gonna happen with the with Brazil's uh, national team I would love to to see Fernando Diniz there. That would be a bold move because he is a bold coach. You know, he is great. Yeah. But he has only one Carioca State League under his belt. So it's it's tough. We're we're not in good shape. Brazil is not in good shape. You know what, what I would, would do? You didn't ask me, but anyway, I, I'm just going to say it. Go I would it. have let Chichi. Seriously, I would have let Chichi. I think he is, probably he is the best Brazilian coach still. 
Nobody agrees with me when I said this. Oh, I said, ah, oh, this shit is loud. Leave him be. No, I said, no, no, it's done. Like, leave him out. Obviously, after what happened in, uh, was it December? It was, right? What happened last December, everyone mm -hmm. was so pissed that Cheech is saying, oh, he uh, didn't need to have uh, changed the team where he should have in the final moments and have uh, put the team back a little. It was only three minutes after all. So um, the people don't really like uh, Chichi anymore. I still do. I still really respect him. He's probably the best Brazilian coach, but I don't know. It, we're out of options. That's the true, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I, I I tend to agree. I mean, there's there's just like this carousel of, of Brazilian coaches that just rotate teams, and they're all sort of in this middle section where I don't think they're – all that great with the exception of some of the the guys that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, and it, it, it's, I think it's costing the national team a lot. Um, reverting, reverting back to Sao Paulo really quickly. Um, you know, you said Dorival Jr. He may not be the one to, to rescue uh, Sao Paulo is the word that I think we were using. So, I mean, that would put a lot on, you know, the, the management, but also the players, right? So yeah. I'm curious, um, Sao Paulo have a lot of top end talent. It looks like more to my eye on further up the pitch. You know, you look at Luciano, Caleri, uh, Galopo, even though he's injured. Um, but even I, we were big fans of Arison, uh, last year. Um, and he's scored that, that, uh, those, that double the other day. Um, just curious, you know, so many weapons up front, but where else in the team do you think they, that they would improve? Uh, or they could improve if, if they want to move up the table. That's the thing. Um, I, th I think Sao Paulo do have kind of like a good squad overall. But the problem is the injuries, the many, many injuries. It's 12 today. We're in uh, May the 18th. 12 injuries. And they're not simple injuries, not muscular injuries or anything like hamstring. It's not. It is like a severe ankle injury, a severe knee injury. We we're just speaking on Galupo. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Fijarezi, Nahuel Fijarezi, this Venezuelan. He's awesome. He's a center back. He is great. He, he had been playing perfectly at Sao Paulo and then got injured. Out of the yeah. blue, he just uh, picked up the severe injury. He's a true Sao Paulino, by the way. If you follow this guy on Instagram, you will see that he, he streams games at Twitch. He always talking about Sao Paulo, wearing the Sao Paulo jersey, uh, <laughs> mocking Corinthians and Palmeirenses and stuff. So uh, Fijarezi is awesome. I, I I love him, but unfortunately picked up this this, this very complicated injury. Um, you you talked about Juliano Galopo. In mm -hmm. terms of, of 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 offense power, um, Sao Paulo do have great options, or if not great, good options. Uh, you talked about uh, Eris, and I have to mention David, former Fortaleza's David. Mm. He is also pretty good and picked up an injury as well. So um, when you bring players in the likes of Juliano Galopo, Joel Ferrarese, uh, Eris and David, and so on and so on, and they're all injury, like, well, what can you expect, right? I mean, we fired Rogério uh, for obviously losing a couple of important matches, but it was right after losing to Botafogo. Botafogo that was on a run. These guys have won five in a row. So definitely, I don't think it was Rogério's mistake. So um, I, I I think São Paulo do have some good pieces. Um, I, th I think the defense is now pretty good. It's pretty solid. If you consider Arboleda as one of the best uh, defenders in Brazil today, um, I would put Gustavo Gomes maybe in front of him. And then mm. I, would, I, I would see only Arboleda up there. Seriously, this guy's great. Even scores his goals at times. Arboleda is so solid, so strong. And and now uh, Beraldo, Lucas Beraldo, playing extraordinarily well. It's to you know, uh, it's still a guy, still a young guy from from Cotia, the academy, right? So that was a surprise. Normally, you see uh, you see this talents with um, especially in the center back rising in their I don't know mid twenties or even thirties, but no, the, the guy's young. And the guy's good, so uh, I am seeing good signs at São Paulo right now with uh, with Arboleda and Beraldo uh, on the wings. Um, I'm I'm a fan of um, Igor Vinicius. I have a, one of our bosses that um, the Brasileirão play Murilo Borges, my personal friend. 
He is the number one fan of, of um, Igor Vinicius. I'm not. I'm probably the number three fan. I don't know. But the fact is the guy has some genius moves, but some stupid moves in the same damn play. That is his problem. Like, he blows, like, but, like he can be, like, Cafu and the worst um, right back in the world in the same minute. It is just crazy. But he's another guy to be to be injured at Sao Paulo. So, you know, it is tough. Um, we are playing with Patrick, Patrick Lanza, Patrick with a Y um, on the left because we don't even have Caio Paulista anymore. I, I don't think he got injured, but he didn't make his way to, to his CFI last night. He stayed in Sao Paulo treating something. I, I I don't think it's any anything serious, but uh, but he didn't travel. So uh, our our uh, first, I would say our first left back is Wellington. He's really good. Also from the academy, I actually do trust him. So. Um, I think São Paulo is well served, but again, the guy is injured. I don't know if there's any data around the world, there's any big club internationally that, that have 12 injuries, 12 serious injuries. That that's probably unique, and and something has been going on with the tricolor. The, and, and it's not it's not 2023 guys that we're talking about. It's 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 uh, 2019, 2020, 21. 22 it's been going on I, i honestly do not know what's wrong something is definitely wrong on the inside of sao paulo and it's not like uh, that that's what i what i tried you know uh, uh, exposing here it's not it's not mm -hmm. a coach it's not it's uh, it's not a a a manager that's gonna solve the problem it's something from the inside so that's why i mentioned old old presidents that by the way juvenile's already dead by the way so uh they really messed up and there's politically speaking, there's something very wrong at Sao Paulo. And I think even the injuries, like when a forward hits the ball on the stands, there's, it is not only technical issues. It is something, it is something that comes from, from the inside. For, politically speaking, Sao Paulo is a disgrace. Like those guys, they're all old. They've been there forever. They they utilize the club in a way that they think it's theirs. It's it's messed up. It's messed up. So um, so that's why, guys. It's 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 gonna be a tough season. Obviously, Dorival is a good coach. He's not a bad coach, but he's not a great coach. He's good enough to make Sao Paulo produce what Sao Paulo can produce. And in my opinion, that is. Maybe a Copa do Brasil final, why not? Maybe a title, maybe a Sul-Americana title, like last year. São Paulo had everything to win the Sul-Americana last season. And also the Paulistão against Palmeiras. You probably follow that one as well. 4-0 mm -hmm. in the final, second game. What the hell was wrong? São Paulo beat Palmeiras. São Paulo was beating Palmeiras 3-0 at Morumbi. And then Rafael Vega scored out of a free kick. And that changed the whole game, the second game. That São Paulo just didn't didn't leave the, the the lockers to 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 go up to the field. So I mean four nil. What are they thinking? And then Jorge Duceni made kind of like the same as same mistakes in the end of the year in the Sul American against Ecuador's Del Valle. But it was formation mistakes. It was also his mistakes. But you know that that that's the thing. I mean that Barry game defined Jorge Duceni's year or spell at Sao Paulo or Sao Paulo's season as well. Had Sao Paulo won that game, the season would have been extraordinary. Think about it. Copa do Brasil final, Libertadores in the next year, and, and, a, uh, and a title, and a, uh, a Sul-Americana title, and a uh, Paulistão final. That would be good enough. That would be really good enough. But it lost. But São Paulo lost that game. So it is now all a disaster. And I have to agree. I mean, uh, São Paulo's season, uh, I I say it was roughly positive. I would put it this way. Like uh, two finals, um, a, a semifinal against Flamengo. Uh, no Libertadores on the next season. So I wouldn't I, I wouldn't really go that far. But that, that's an image that passes through the media. I mean, oh, it was... It was a disaster. São Paulo is about to play the Sul Americana again. São Paulo lost an easy title to to uh, Del Valle. So you know. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you say a lot of things that resonate. Um, 
especially talking about the inner workings of the club. Obviously, Enric and I are, are Santos supporters, and we've been through that for sure over the past few administrations. And it's like a lose lose because now we're with an administration that that um, you know is really doing everything by the books and um, you know is keeping the financials much more in order. Where now people are getting on this administration for lack of results on the pitch. Where it's like you know these these clubs, it's almost like these people have it's two extremes. It's either a situation like you're describing in Sao Paulo, where you know there's all sorts of stuff going on behind the scenes and that could lead to great results or bad results, or the flip side where people are trying to be responsible and it, it's it's just tough. Um, let's uh, let's just before we move on, I know we, go ahead. Let me just add, I think Sao Paulo and Santos at this point are are very close. Mm. Uh, I think there are two similar clubs. In my list, I put Sao Paulo as the biggest team of Brazil, Santos as the second. Mm -hmm. uh, Santos have two Club World Cups, three Libertadores, numerous Campeonato Brasileiros, never been relegated, and it's something that I, I really consider. Santos, Flamengo, and Sao Paulo. Stand as the three only teams never have been relegated. So at this point, I think Santos and São Paulo are pretty close. Andres Rueda has been doing, if there are any Santos supporters uh, listening to us, and I say that has been doing a good job, I think they will want to kill me. But uh, I think like Julio Casares, I think they both have been wanting to um, ease in the, the crisis, financially speaking. So uh, I think I think they're pretty close. Even in terms of the squad, I think Sao Paulo in 23 uh, has been a slightly better than Santos. Santos living a, a bigger crisis, I would I would put it this way, than Sao Paulo. But I think politically speaking, just to wrap up, Peter, mm -hmm. Santos and Sao Paulo are, are pretty close, my friend. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, and you make a crucial point. I, get, I, not, I don't get a lot of hate running the Santos account, but I have the opinion that similarly that – He's uh, Rueda is, is doing a, a decent job in keeping the books. We knew it was going to be a less, you know, successful season. And that's just the price you pay for all these years of, uh, of, you know, under or, you know, doing some shady stuff with the books basically. Exactly. Um, and I, I think another equivalence you make is the, the, the squad on paper, I think is underperforming. You look at Sao Paulo and Santos. Absolutely. Absolutely. High quality players, uh, disorganized disorganized off the pitch as well and i think that 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 uh, makes us suffer a little bit exactly i i think uh centers are good uh every time i say that i like uh Santos defense for example it, it was a pity what happened with barman the other week yes. uh i've always liked him since his uh america days and even before uh and then when Santos signed him and said well he's really good this guy is really good he even scored his goals i was talking about gomez arboleda these three are great defenders that also score. So Bowerman, it was really a pity. And 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 this lack of luck, you know, that uh, went on with Santos happens every day with Sao Paulo. Every day. We, we saw what happened to Pedrinho, this midfielder at Sao Paulo, higher than the beginning of the year. I think the, the guy bit his girlfriend. <laughs> and then he, he was forced to resign. I mean... Obviously, it's 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 some 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 jinx, but um, it's also like what are the types of players that these clubs have been been looking for? And and Santos was just unlucky in that in that matter. So Santos now out of Bowerman, I think he's good. But uh, but I'm a big Soteldo fan. I, I think this guy's fantastic. And and the academy. I mean, we all always talk about the academies that Brazil don't play. Uh, Santos Academy is simply out of this world i mean now angelo what is that guy he is awesome david washington i had never heard of him and then he became a pro started scoring every other game or every day i don't know back-to-back -back goals by the way i yeah. think in the last round right fantastic uh, uh marcos leonardo he's also really good so um so i do think Santos is underperforming exactly what you said uh, i think Santos do have the potential as sao paulo to reach like for example, w why not like a, a, a Sul Americana final between Santos and São Paulo? I think mm -hmm. I think that's feasible. Um, you know, Botafogo is involved as well. But anyway, uh, Copa do Brasil, uh, Santos face uh, Bahia. Is that it? Yeah, Santos Bahia. Yep. 
tied nil nil yesterday. So uh, definitely chances for for Santos to move on. So uh, I agree, Santos underperforming. São Paulo, I think, getting closer to their I'm not going to say limit, but um, because I I do think that São Paulo have the potential of because guys, come on, Johnny Caleri is huge. This guy is phenomenal. He scores so many goals. He He really likes São Paulo as well. And for São Paulinos, that really counts. And I do see Jonathan Caleri being like, I don't know if a Brazilian top scorer in the end of the season because we do have Cano and Chiquinho Soares right now. But uh, but, but Caleri is honestly one of the best strikers we have. So I do, again, I'll state it again. I do see potential in São Paulo and for Santos as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And so much that we said so far about Sao Paulo season in the uh, Brasileiro in uh, Copa Libertadores or Sudamericana last year when they had that shocking loss against an independente team that was able to beat Corinthians. Let's not forget. So they're a tough side to beat. And even Flamengo in the in the final of Real Copa Sudamericana. So that was a tough team. But let's switch to Copa do Brasil. As you mentioned, the Santos match against Bahia. I want to go over. Sport Recife, uh, zero, Sao Paulo, two. These two teams are great teams, even Sport, despite being in second division. They just tied a match last Saturday or Sunday against Ituano in their home stadium, so not too bad. But they come on to this game with 23 meetings, uh, and Sport only won two, last one being in the Campeonato Brasileiro in 2015. What were your expectations before this match? Look, um, a plane away at, uh, it's called Ilha do Retiro. How would you say that? Retreat Island. Um, it is tough. It is never easy to face uh, Sport Recife in there. Um, they were perfect at Ilha do Retiro this season. Perfect. I mean, no ties, only wins. So it is definitely tough. But I'm going to be honest. I was in that very couch watching the draw of the Copa do Brasil. And I saw myself celebrating when I saw... Uh, a sport Recife's name on that piece of paper. Seriously, I, I I know that we've seen situations in which you know you would get deeply disappointed after you know celebrating a celebrating a draw and then actually going through the game, but uh, but I think it went more or less how I was expecting it to go. Um, yeah, two nil. So São Paulo could even have scored more. I, I if I'm not mistaken, the game ended with São Paulo taking twenty shots. So that is that is great. São Paulo now uh, are not conceding. São Paulo conceded uh, uh, Roger Gadges' goal, but um, in in the previous Brasileirão match week. But but São Paulo's defense pretty solid by now. São Paulo's uh, defense under Dorival Júnior. I mean, I think conceded only two goals, guys. Come on, you gotta you know, you gotta see the difference. And you're hearing this from a Rogério Ceni fan. We gotta we gotta respect Dorival Júnior's talent in organizing these. You know. Well, from a scoreline point of view, people might say, oh, two goals was not enough. But when you actually watch the game, I think Sport Recife was very dangerous, especially in the first half. Although Sao Paulo attacked first, it was uh, Rafael who, in my opinion, deserved man of the match for that first half, especially making sensational save after save. And he just kept uh, Sao Paulo in the game despite playing away. And when you go to the second half, in my opinion... Fabinho's red card just changed everything and that gave uh, Sao Paulo the chance to not only score a goal but two and in if in the first half it was the goalkeeper as the man of the match I think in the second it was the man that just came on Marcos Paulo he assisted the first goal to Luciano and then scored uh, with 30 minutes playing in this in this match so very incredible I think and I don't know if maybe it, if Sao Paulo wouldn't have won, you would have been like, oh, maybe we deserve to win or no. But I think this is a fantastic result going into the next leg. What do you think? Absolutely. It's it's an awesome result. Uh, people are considering Sao Paulo already qualified. I wouldn't go that far. But uh, but it's going to be very tough for a sport receiver to go all the way to Sao Paulo and beat the Tricolor at Morumbi. That, that, that is obviously not impossible, but that is very tough that it's going to be really complicated for for sport to revert that score line and i think what you said is perfect by the way uh, i was remembering that i was starting to like describe sao paulo and i started 
from the from the right wing. I totally forgot about our keeper Rafael, guys. Come on, this guy has been great. And and you know, as a, a Rogério fan, I I really do miss a great keeper. We had so many. I've listed in in a couple of São Paulo matches that we've done in the Brasileirão play. I I've brought the list of keepers that uh, passed through São Paulo since Sani retired, and they are like in the uh uh more over ten numbers. Seriously, it's it's uh Volpi, it, it, Sidão, Renan Ribeiro, Dennis, and the list goes on. Even with the two guys, there are still there. Felipe Alves and Jandri. Uh, but right now we do have a keeper, Rafael. And and my friend Eric, you are absolutely right. I think this guy has been making the difference. But, you know, um, when I make my analysis, I also consider uh, the chances created for, for from the other side as, you know, if your keeper is able to save them, it's, it's fine. You got a great keeper and that's your credit. That happens to Palmeiras, guys, all the time. All the time. And, and Palmeiras' defense is really good. Really strong with uh, Murilo Gomes, even with Luan at times. Really strong. But Weverton has a lot of work to do in, I would say, 90% of the games that Palmeiras plays. I didn't watch Palmeiras Fortaleza last night. but um, So so I can't say particularly about that match. But uh, but for, from the games that I personally broadcast, Weverton has a lot of work to do. And as you said, Rafael worked tremendously well yesterday as well. But... The red card that you also mentioned made all the difference, but that is, um, you know, uh, part of the job. And and credit again for São Paulo to have uh, made that trip and uh, have gotten a win against Sport Recife, which we have to remember the only team that is playing the second division that it's uh, currently present in the Brazil Cups round of 16. So obviously it's it's a different deal. Uh, Internacional yesterday lost to America. America and rock bottom of the the competition. <laughs> uh, Inter made the trip to to Belo Horizonte, lost two nil. Two goals scored by the way by Boy Bandido, the the bandit ox. That is fantastic. Yeah, hundred percent. I watched a little bit of that match, and it happened to be the two last penalties of the match. I think it was a bit harsh on Inter, but. Two red cards, like that's exactly what you can expect from a Mano Menezes team that has been suffering this Campeonato Brasileiro so far. I will I will be in the Grenal. I think you know what that means. The Grêmio Internacional game. That's um, the kickoff set for 6.30 on Sunday, Brazil time. So um, take out an, an, an hour from that and your time. But... Um, I think if if Internacional gets defeated, it it might be the end for for Mano Menezes. I think because it, it's complicated, right? Internacional, um, yeah. Uh, well, losing to America, uh, I think they can win the second leg at Beira Rio. Uh, anything and everything is possible, but uh, but but it's really a, a terrible run for for Inter, right? I don't think he's gonna have an easy job on on Sunday. It's against their arch enemy, so. It's going to be tough for our monument is. Yep. Uh, and I'm assuming you're going to be commentating that match. So it's going to be a really big match. Uh, I think I'll have to watch that as well. Like such a big derby. I think Gremio won uh, the Campeonato Gaúcho against Inter. Or was it the final or no? It was the no, regular they beat season. Cassius. Yeah. It was the regular season when they played, uh, and they both team both teams scored, and then that was the last goal scored in the 90th minute by Grêmio to win it all. But uh, Mauricio, uh, Peter mentioned this in the beginning of the episode. You being a commentator for Paramount Plus, when did you start doing this? You mentioned commenting maybe a game in 2021 in the Fluminense match. Is that correct? Oh, uh, that was my very first, but it was the first year of the contract, and I commented like four per round in 2021 already. So no, uh, it was the same deal as this season. I was already all the way in 2021. Uh, that was just the first game. I think it was nil-nil, by the way, the first game that I ever commented, uh, São Paulo Fluminense at Maracanã, or is it 1-1? Can't remember. But uh, no, nil-nil. Both teams missed penalties. Thiago Volpi saved one. And I can't recall who Fluminense's keeper was. Marcos Felipe, maybe. I don't know. Uh, saved another. So, nil-nil that game. Fredi from Fluminense played that match. But, 
No, uh, 2021, 2022, 2023, the same type of contract, four games, maybe even sometimes five games per round. This is life for a Brazilian don't play commentator. Nice, nice. And 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 curious, how did that come up uh come about? I know you said you were a journalism uh student in in college, university. Um, you know, how did how did you come to that opportunity? Was that something that you always wanted to do? Um, you know, how did that come about? Uh I I have to mention my dearest friend Moody Luborges again cuz he was the one responsible for bringing me to uh to the Brazil don't play we graduated together in college and and he's been working basically as a businessman for the for, for the branch so um he he was in a need of of we here in Brazil by the way call it narrators i know it's a different we have the play by play commentator and the well second commentator i'm the second guy um so he was in a need of 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 uh, narradores e comentaristas so Two types of commentators uh and then he he called me literally called me and, and and said well i know that you've been working with english for a while now and that you uh obviously that you love football so uh would you like to be a brazilian commentator i said what D what <laughs> do you think i'm qualified like i had never done this before i i had literally never commented a game in portuguese my mother language before Uh, the thing that I had done before was working at a um, a radio show uh, with Murilo Borges, by the way, not alongside him in the studio, but he was also one of the one of the directors on the radio. Uh, it was called a press room, Sala de Imprensa. It was like on a Saturday morning. We would uh, discuss football, discuss the round, but it was like a more of more or less like a supporter. I, I would definitely play the the São Paulo supporter. There was another Palmeirense. There was another Santista guy. So you know that there's this viewpoint as well in that show. That that was that was the closest that I had gotten to to commenting football. That's why I was so so nervous. And then I don't know if you guys know this guy, John Cottrell. Uh, you definitely play FIFA, right? Uh. The, the, the John Cottrell's type of of uh, football commenting it's it's exactly the same as um missing his name now the the guy who who uh, um does FIFA and and seeing myself broadcasting games with John Cottrell by my side talking about football in English with this British accent it was just crazy to me seriously it is something that I think that I've all that I had always wanted to do but I didn't really realize I didn't really think it was possible before because in my mind the Brazilian was for Brazilians mm -hmm. who abroad would like to uh to 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 follow and and watch uh Brazilian games uh Chapecoense Juventude on a Sunday morning like that that has no audience at all Uh, even even I would think uh, obviously for Brazilians like the broadcasting in Portuguese, there are millions of Brazilians living in the states and uh, England, Australia, and so on. So definitely in Portuguese we, we we need to broadcast it. But in English, I mean, I was surprised to to say the least when when Murilo said that even existed, that was even a thing. Um, I I I knew that. Um, They afterwards, by the way, I knew that in 2020 they brought it broadcasted like one game per round. Charles Mills was there. I mentioned Charles Mills, right? Charles Mills mm -hmm. was great. Um, Charles Mills was there, John Cottrell was there too. I think Ricardo Homoni was there in the very first year, but that was like a a trial year, that was like a uh, uh, like a Uh, a showcase of what I think Brazil don't play could be. So um, now we have 10 games per round. It's it's 100% of the matches that we're we're broadcasting. So um, yeah, that that's Brazil don't play's history for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's so cool. I mean, we love and we always talk about you know trying to get more eyeballs on on the Brazilian game and and the South American game in general, right? We love Libertadores and Sudamericana just as much as um or almost as much we should say as the as Brasil and and Copa do Brazil um just curious actually on your on that first match 
Um, you know, I could imagine it's got to be nerve wracking for anyone to step up and narrate or, you know, provide color commentary to a live match. Um, I can't imagine doing that in a second language. You know, how nervous were you in that first match or, you know, did did uh, did John, you know, kind of make you comfortable? You know, what was that experience like? And do you remember if you made any errors or anything like that? Um, uh, I must have. Uh, I basically wrote a million phrases in a Google Doc, and uh, and every time he called me, I think I I read I read them. I mm. think that was it. I I had to like because it, it's it's what I told you guys before. Like uh, I've always spoken English, but then speaking English about football, it was mm. something that I was definitely not used to. Definitely not. So so doing that for the first time was very. Uh, I think you used the word nerve wracking and, and uh, that's probably accurate to what, mm. what I was feeling at the time. I saw myself with this, sorry, John, old guy that had like a billion years of experience. I had never done that before. I, I honestly told him that before. So John, man, it's, I, I had, I've never done this before, man. Uh, take easy on me. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big Sao Paulo guy. So, uh, I understand about everything that's going on with this club, but Fluminense, like, more or less, so I had to, like, study. I think I watched uh, 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 the videos. I, I read every piece of news there was in the in the week. I, I over-prep, really, for that game. And, and I still do, really. I talk to other commentators. They don't do what I do. And, I'm, uh, and it's not because I'm better than them. It's the opposite. It's because probably they understand the game better than I do. And I, I feel that I have to, you know, make up for it. You know, I have to, uh, I still, like, before every single game, I, I spent at least one hour and a half, two hours to every single game. At least. I have I have my prep script, you know. I have everything that I got to do uh, prior to a game, basically, you know. It's, yeah. yeah it was a, but just a quick answer is like i was very nervous i was sweating i was and and seriously not only in the first game because because in the second one it was a different commentator and in the third the third different commentator and and then in the 10th game uh something happened and then in the 20th game uh i wanted to say something that didn't turn out that good Mm -hmm. uh still happens from time to time i think uh maybe if it was in portuguese i would be saying different stuff by the way we do have two personalities both in, in, in i don't know if you guys speak spanish speak french german i don't know but people say that we do acquire two personalities when you're when you're speaking a second language you're kind of like a different person guys <laughs> yeah i completely agree with you and you mentioned being nervous, being maybe an obstacle for you in your job. Is that the only one, though? Or do you have other things that maybe when somebody somebody you're commenting with mentions something and you're not really aware of like a highlight or a player's name? How does that go for you? I, I, I have been a journalist for a while, but uh, I'm an English teacher, so I do teach English on a daily basis. Uh, after COVID, just from home, so just online, I have this one friend who uh, go to his house and um, and help him in what he needs. But I uh, also work as a translator, so I did this uh, review jobs as well in Portuguese, review books. Uh, but I, I have to say that Brasileirão play commentary now has become my my uh, first job, my main job, because it's it's what I told you guys. I spent a lot of time uh, getting ready for the games. A lot of times, you know. It's really not, at this point, something connected 100% with the language anymore. You know, it's it's more like, uh, I would like to be that guy who can read the game perfectly and read the lines and understand everything about every player and physically know every player that is something that i have to give especially charles mills the credit like he know he he, he looks at a screen and and can be like a top bottom camera can be something from very very far and then he would know who the guy is i still have difficulty knowing all of that so uh, I, I've, I've, by the way, have been a uh, first commentator in a couple of matches already. 
um, with Murilo Borges, my friend, who's also a big São Paulo fan, uh, and two São Paulo games. São Paulo, América Mineiro back in 2021, the last game, round number 38. I did the play-by-play -play thing. Uh, Murilo Borges was myself. And then last year, uh, São Paulo 4, Goiás 0. Um, with Murilo as well. That was great. Good experience, although São Paulo didn't uh, end up qualifying to the Libertadores. We were in the Libertadores zone for like 10 minutes. It was crazy. And then I think Fortaleza scored and then we got knocked out. But um, it's, it's, it's less connected to the language and more connected to football knowledge. You know, that's, that's another thing that would terrify me would be to to be a commentator in the Brasileirão play in Portuguese. Because then you would be speaking to the fans, man. You would have a guy in Miami who's a big Flamengo supporter. I would be having to explain to this guy what Flamengo is doing. And I don't, I still don't know if I can. I don't think so. I will do it my way anyway. You know, it that'll be tough. Thank God in English, like I've, I've learned new words. I've I've been expressing myself well in English in, in the last couple of I, I would say like you know in the 50th game I did in in 2021 like I I picked up the way that the the broadcast goes. I picked up the the way to analyze like a first half, like the pre-game commentary. I think I got myself around that topic. But in terms of you know. Football knowledge, like the, the 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 tactic and the oh, who's attacking the lines? Like who's actually given combat and stuff? I still struggle with that. So I kind of have, I think, if I were to describe my my thing. And another thing I wanted to ask is, how do you know every player's name? Is that something you prepare in front in be, before the match, or do you just look up numbers and memorize faces? How do you do that? It's what I was saying, right? I still do have difficulty in that. Obviously, I, I've told you the number of matches that I personally broadcast every year. So in like the third round, I think they do get more familiar to us. But there are clubs that we don't broadcast as many matches. And there are clubs like, I, I'm going to say, Goiás, Curitiba, uh, America, even clubs that don't have that famous players. I mean, when I, when we broadcast São Paulo Flamengo, I probably know everyone, not probably, but I do know everyone, and even at the bench, uh, just from looking at them. But I have I have like an extensive material about every single club and every single player. I go to a website that has uh, material about all of them with photos, with data, with with everything, with titles won by those players. And, and I have it. I have my Google Docs, and, and that's how I prepare my material to every game. I, I go into my Google Drive, I pick up um, Flamengo, and I pick up Sao Paulo's file. I update my numbers in all of those players. I go to the website again and, and copy and paste numbers of goals, numbers of, of assists, numbers of, um, I don't know, games played in each competition. And and I basically update the material and and there I have it. But obviously, what you're saying is sometimes like the 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 the, um, the board is raised with a number of a guy I had never heard before. I don't know, but I can't even name any because I don't remember. But uh, Goyas left back from the academy. I I have no idea. And then I'll pretend to have an idea what I'm talking about because I'm going to mention, oh, João da Silva is 26, uh, has been at Feyenoord and has provided three assists already this year. But I'm obviously reading those numbers because it's basically impossible for me to know all that. It's very rare that I, I don't think I know how many goals even Johnny Caleri has scored in the year. That is, I, I have to have all of that in front of me. I, I can't. I can't keep all of that in my mind. It is impossible. Number of assists, number of goals in the Brasileiro, numbers of games played as a starter in the year. That is stuff. That is stuff. So that's why I said I do like to get over prepared. And 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 sometimes like I tell the other guys that and they what two hours preparing for a game that lasts less than that? What are you doing? Let let's have a beer. No, but no, I I would just feel I would just feel too nervous and uh, 
you would just probably the, the play-by-play guy would ask me, hey, now um, Ahaskaeta is coming to the game. I would say, oh, I like him. What what I would <laughs> I, I need I need stuff. I need he's good because you know uh, in 2019 he was one of the best, if not the single best for Flamengo. And this year he already has 10 goals. I don't know. I feel that I need to have facts, data in front of me if I want to be calm in the broadcast. I think this is more or less to, I I said this before already, that this is like to compensate my lack of, not lack of knowledge, because I do have knowledge, but, you know, probably the the lack of experience uh, and uh, following Goyas, or with all due respect, uh, you know, even Fortaleza, club that I I came to like, but it's, it's tough. We do have to prepare ourselves. It is not easy because at times there are there are questions, right? There are questions from the the play by play guy and even sometimes from from the audience. So you got to be ready. Yeah, and and John Cotterro is so well informed. He's 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 just impeccable, and his accent's great too. Uh, to the American air, ear, there's just nothing like a British accent commentating on football. It's just it's just the best. Um, <laughs> But I want and to by ask the way, you, as you're in this, um, John Cotter used to be the the magazine guy. That there's mm-hmm. this weekly magazine show, and John Cotter used to be the official voice. And uh, and the company now it's changing on the inside, so I think now John Cotter is not responsible for that product anymore. And I am. <laughs> I've been doing this this season. And I, I, as you you can hear, I don't really have a British accent. So I think for our clients, if you're saying that there's nothing better than a British <laughs> accent for the American ear, I don't think that these guys are are liking it that that much. But I don't know. I'm doing my best, guys. Come on. No, I I, I think it's great. And as long as the accent conveys authenticity, I think to Americans, the British accent it's the home of football, obviously. So there's authenticity. But to hear a Brazilian comment on Brazilian matches is just is is great too. Um, and by the way, I do enjoy those magazines. Uh, I, I watch them on Paramount Plus. So, um, but I wanted to ask you on, on the topic. I, I follow your colleague Anthony Wells on Instagram. He's occasionally posting kind of the setup of how you guys comment. Um, you know, do you ever get to travel to the stadiums, or are you always commenting remotely? Always remotely, it's in a studio. Uh, man, it looks like a train. It's like look, 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 like a train corridor because it's, I don't know if it's 25, 30 single studios there to each side. It's mm-hmm. it's crazy. It's called uh, Casa Blanca. That's the, that's the name of the studio. It's right in front of uh, Parque do Ibirapuera. Guys, get used to it because at one point you're going to be coming to Sao Paulo. And uh, <laughs> yes, Ibirapuera, we will. Park, Ibirapuera Park, it's, it's probably one of my favorite places in town. So it's right across from the Ibirapuera Park. And uh, every single match is broadcast is from there. So I would really love to make my way to a stadium. Like that would be a dream, right? Mm-hmm. But I think in terms of you know the logistic, the signal, and 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 stuff, uh, it is unfortunately not possible. Not even from home. Um, the the company that we work at uh, has many other events. The Brazilian Olympic Channel is under uh, their name as well. So uh, they do broadcast like judo, taekwondo, athletics, and stuff. Uh, and they can do it from home, so which is really good. But the, the Brasileirão, it's all in there. It's all concentrated at this Casa Blanca online um, studio. So, yeah. Big shout out to Anthony Wells, one of my good friends in the Brasileirão play. He's also a reporter, a TV reporter. Uh, used to work for CNN. Now, with, as a freelancer for other companies, Anthony Wells, one of our best uh, narradores. Abraço, meu querido Anthony Wells. I'm sure he's gonna he's gonna listen to this podcast. Yeah, yeah, definitely shout out him, and I hope you're listening, Anthony. Um, big fan of yours and and all the other uh, Paramount Plus uh, or excuse me, Brasil Rao, uh play commentators. I watch on Paramount Plus. That's why. Now, now one I have the a same. question. I have a question yeah. regarding Paramount Plus because I have no idea. We do we don't get. I, I get Paramount Plus here mm-hmm. at home, but it's a totally different content. So yep. um, my question is. How is the product delivered? Can can you stream the matches, any match that you want? How many mm-hmm. matches do you get? Can you get replays? Do you watch the magazine as well? Like- yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can watch them all live. I get all the replays and I get the magazine. 
Wow. Um, and we're not sponsored, but we could be Paramount Plus. If you're listening, please sponsor us. Um, <laughs> and it's it's great. It's such a great listening ex- or experience. You get Champions League. You get Italian Serie A. Um, it's really great, and I, I couldn't I couldn't recommend it more. And this, awesome. something- this is awesome. No, last year we were having this. Um, uh, I don't know how they used to call it, but it was um, like a longer pre-game show. I don't know. They used to have like an official name. I can't recall it, but uh, and and it was exclusively for Paramount Plus. I felt honored, seriously, because we have no idea where these games are going to in other countries. But having like our voice going to 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 a company in the likes of Paramount Plus, CBS. Yeah. I was like, oh man, this is this is responsibility, and it's usually like Flamengo, Palmeiras, São Paulo, Corinthians, uh, well, Santos, um, uh, Flamengo as well. So it's usually like the big game. So like w- when I was in the um, in the script there, and there was like this extensive, I, I don't know, extended. It's not break. I don't know pre-game. Um, I, I was like, oh man, so I some extra responsibility in that day it is it is great it is awesome shout out paramount plus sponsor these guys yeah smoking snake podcast these guys are great yeah and another thing i wanted to mention is also not only they have replays but replays from two or three brasileiros before because oh. before the season started i was wondering if i can watch any highlight or not only highlights but the whole 90 minutes of the match that was happening last season and the first one that was the most recent match was that Santos against Fortaleza, which we lost, I think, 2-0 at home in Villa Belmiro. And I keep going and scrolling in my TV all the way down and down just to see, like, when when's the most early match that was highlighted. And this goes back to 2019 or 2020, oh, and it's just that's crazy. That's a great product. Great product. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going right. to... Right, I'm gonna try and use a VPN to get those those contents in here. <laughs> yeah, get it. I get it. I mean, there's there's uh there's so much good stuff. So you you should definitely check that out. Get the viewing experience because uh, it's it's something else to hear Mauricio Destri, Anthony Wells, you know, on the comms. It's it's great. It's great. Um, all right, Man, Mauricio. To me, uh, is it, being fantastic too. <laughs> I think one of the first times that we're actually getting feedback from anyone, and it's not any, any feedback, it's like mm-hmm. you know, it's a specialized feedback. I'm having a blast, guys. Seriously, that's awesome to hear. And 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 so are we. We're so ecstatic to have you here. We've taken up so much of your time. We're so thankful, oh, but we can't let well, you go. It's, it's over. No, come on, oh, man. Well, oh, 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 it's not <laughs> over. Hold on, hold on. We cannot let you go without some of our, we ask all our guests, you have to make your predictions. Okay. So mm. uh, we're just going to ask, you know, um, uh, Brasile Rao, who's going to win and maybe where Sao Paulo end up. Uh, maybe your best guess at Libertadores champions. Uh, you can even throw in Sudamericana as well. And then I want you, I think this episode is going to come out after this, this weekend's fixtures. Um, so, the listeners can hear your prediction in real time and and, and think back and All see right. if you're right. But go ahead and predict if you can, Gray. Now, if you want to oh. predict the score line, if you want to predict if there's how many red cards they're going to be at the end, whatever. <laughs> but uh, oh, don't, red don't... cards! <laughs> I think that's even that's even more important than the actual score line in the end. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to, Brasil or Al, Sudamericana, Brasil or uh, uh, Libertadores. And then if you want to just give a, a, a scoreline prediction for Grenal. Okay. All um, right. Sounds good. I, I usually don't do this because uh, I'm never right. Like, I don't bet because right. I hate it. I don't know. I, I don't like it, but that's about to be a cool experience here. Okay. I think I think that Palmeiras will win the Brasileirão again. I think. Not that I hate Palmeiras. I like it because of my family. But come on. We, we've had enough of these guys. Somebody has to go up and... And take the crown out of their heads. It, 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 I hope it's São Paulo. Anyway, uh, I think Palmeiras will win the Brasileirão. But I also think that Flamengo will win their fourth Libertadores. Wow! I think okay. you know, and I think it's it's about to be between Palmeiras and Flamengo because I can see Palmeiras being a very solid. But Flamengo definitely have the 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 better squad, right? When comparing both, um, 
Flamengo have. They're now, by the way, bringing Luis Araujo, a former São Paulo player. I don't know Saw if you that, remember yeah. this guy, right? But he he was the uh, major league soccer for, for yeah. a while. Right? Yeah, he, Atlanta he United. Yep. Atlanta United, exactly. Atlanta. So uh, he was uh, before it was in France, and now uh, Atlanta. Now Flamengo. He is pretty good. Flamengo has a an incredible uh, uh, roster overall. So uh, fantastic team. I think even better than Palmeiras, but no comparison to what Palmeiras has been um, has been doing in recent season. And it's still not over. The pieces that Palmeiras have is just great. Everton, Gustavo Gomes, Vega, Dudu, Ronnie, Zafael now playing really well. So I do think Palmeiras will win the Brasileirão. My Libertadores guess will be for Flamengo. And then I'm going to repeat myself here because I'm going to... I want the final of the Sul-Americana to be Santos and São Paulo. And then I'm going to tell you guys that I also think it's going to be between, between Santos and São Paulo. That's like wishful thinking, but anyway... <laughs> Doesn't matter. That's my that's my guess. Okay. And then the champion doesn't matter. Whoever wins that, it's it's fine. <laughs> You're such a gentleman. <laughs> and, oh, and 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 come on, the, the Copa do Brasil, that is so unpredictable. It's it, it's crazy, man. Anyone can win that, honestly. It can be Atlético Mineiro, can be Flamengo Palmeiras, can be São Paulo, I think. It can be Fluminense, maybe. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get Fluminense as the Brazil Cup champ to honor Fernando Diniz because he does deserve like a second now uh, big title in his in his career and and then we we start the match week number seven is that it all That's the results are, well you could just uh, just go ahead and predict Grenal we don't we don't Grenal yeah 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 all right so uh, Grêmio Internacional I'll be in the commentary booth for that game and I think it's gonna be two one Grêmio with uh, red cards, like at least two aside, at least two aside, because these guys, Gaúchos, they're crazy. It's like at least two aside. I think they're they're happy with that. Two aside, well, for match week number eight, only two players missing. Well, I think they're gonna be fine. But uh, not that I'm gonna root for Internacional because normally I I tend to like you know equilibrate my my things, but uh. I think, unfortunately, for, for Internacional, now Luisito Suarez at Grêmio. You guys saw the goal he, that he scored against Cruzeiro last night. It was just... so good. Uh, yeah, exactly. Such a such a screamer. Anyway, um, so I think my, my final guess is going to 2-1. Okay, so it's really going to surprise me if Grêmio does not win that game. Awesome. Awesome. Mauricio, thank you so much. Um, oh, where can people find you online? Um, where can they find your stuff? Uh, and, and where can they, uh, we already shouted it out. If you're in the U S Paramount plus, you can always catch Mauricio on there, but where can people find you online? Okay. Um, both Twitter and Instagram at Maudestri. So M A U D E S T R I. Uh, that's it. Uh, I'm not a very Instagram guy, like a uh, posting stuff. Like Anthony Wells is, by the way, he, he makes sure he posts every single Brazilian don't play games, which is great. I don't do it, but uh, on Twitter, I'm a little bit more active. So make sure you follow me at Maudestri on both uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. Uh, guys, call me again. Come on. This was, this was a pleasure. 100%. We will 100%. surely do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is awesome. And Mauricio, one more time. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Everyone's going to love this interview. And yeah, we're gonna have to. We're definitely having you back on uh, sometime soon. Please, and, uh, please do. This was awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, if you want to make this uh, a little bit more regular, make sure to 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 text me. I'll always be at your disposal. Thank you guys so much. And really, what an honor to have qualified audience to our <laughs> Brazilian play. This is this is the best feedback I could ever have gotten. This is fantastic, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're so thankful to have you here. And for sure, we'll visit you one day in Sao Paulo. Oh, so. yeah. Definitely. There's that, too. There's that, too. You, you you guys love Brazilian football and you've never been to Brazil. That's that's an outrage. Come on. Buy your ticket, man. You earn dollars. Come on. It's it's cheap. It's cheap. We'll fix that. We'll fix that. And, and hopefully soon. But once again, yes. Mauricio Destri, everyone. 
Thank Thanks you so, so much. much, everyone. Thanks. Good night.